Hi, I'm Anne DeLisi, and in this two-part episode of Essential Cooking, my co-host, Chef James Rigato, along with Chef Molly Mitchell from Rose's Fine Food in Detroit, get you ready for Thanksgiving. The turkey, the brine, the sides, and some Thanksgiving food history. So uh, Thanksgiving's coming like a freight train, and uh, this is when everybody's kind of starting to think about, well, you should be thinking about it by now. The first Thanksgiving, it apparently, didn't have a turkey at all. It was more like wild game is what they had. Well, and back that makes in, sense. And there you go, 1621. <laughs> So turkey wasn't on the menu, but now we eat about 45 to 46 million turkeys during Thanksgiving, which is a whole lot of birds. And wild turkeys can run 20 miles an hour. Other turkeys, not so fast, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Benjamin Franklin, as a matter of fact, you saw little fun facts, and then we'll get to the business. Benjamin Franklin wanted the turkey to be the national bird, not the eagle. I think it's probably good. It was (laughs) overruled. (laughs) And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's first meal in space after walking on the moon was foil packets of Roasted turkey. Wow. So Just how about like at that? Home. Yeah. Just like at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So what we're going to do now. So uh, a lot of people have already started making their turkey plans. They've ordered it. They're waiting on it and all that other kind of stuff. But some folks are still maybe uh, not quite ready for it. So what do we want to tell them to do right now just regarding the turkey, James? Well, I would decide where <laughs> you're getting your turkey from because, as you know, there's lots of you know, food issues this year with the supply chain. So I would line up your turkey, whether that's through D'Artagnan or a local company. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, your local farmers, even on, um, you know, different, different you know, farmer forums. You can pretty much, there's some farmers out there. I know like Steve Allen at, at Stephen Rockies, he raises turkeys. So you can, you know, swing by his house and pick one up. That's what I used to do at the root. Mm-hmm. We get all of Steve's turkeys. <laughs> so I would definitely try to secure your bird uh, and nothing against, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to you know run a, you know, a smear campaign, but I try to stay away from the large big box birds because they're not raised. Big box birds. Yeah, big, <laughs> big box birds are not raised as uh, humanely and it's not as good for you. So the, the more local and natural your bird is, the better. Um, and I'm also a proponent of brining. So I know that that's a controversial situation for some people. Like, you know, the higher quality of the bird, you shouldn't brine it, et cetera. Turkey is a very, um, you know, lean, large-breasted bird. So, like, mm-hmm. you're talking about a lot of white meat that's going to be pretty dry. So mm-hmm. I always recommend brining. So start researching your brining recipes. Um and yes, so, so secure your bird is number one. Yeah, Farm Field Table's got them. I think Merrill's got them. Um, there's also, I got an email, and there was a farm near the airport called, uh, D, it's like DTW uh, flightpath.com, and they have heritage, heritage turkeys out there. And I was like, okay, so that's another farm. So everybody's been telling me all kinds of things. But there are plenty of places to support your local businesses to get a turkey. So start thinking about that now. Okay, so when to start brining the bird? Well, that depends on size. So if you're doing a small event this year, let's say Thanksgiving for two, you can always do a chicken or even a pheasant. You know, you don't need to stick with turkey because they're pretty large. Um, But if it's, I always say if it's over 20 pounds, you want to enter like 36, 48 hours. But if it's under 20 pounds, a 24-hour brine is usually just fine. Right. And this time of year, so this is a little trick, right? My sister kind of uh, had me, you know, think about this because she's like, what do I do with a 25-pound turkey? in a normal home refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So usually this time of year, the weather's perfect to get a tub with a very secure lid and brine it and put it in your garage or out on your patio. Just make sure you, if you have, you know, if you're in the country, maybe put a couple bricks on top of it or, you know, obviously don't let any critters get into it. But usually it's, you know, the right temperature to leave it outside in the Mm -hmm. brine in a, in a secure vessel. So if you do have a large bird and you have a, you know, and it looks like it's going to be under 40 degrees outside, I would say brown it, brine it outside. You can just put it in a cooler, right? Mm-hmm. Tell your husband to get Correct. all the beer yes, out of the cooler because exactly. <laughs> I'm putting a bird in there. Just make sure you like sa- sanitize it, like wash it out. You know, obviously you don't want to, you know, you, uh, if he was like throwing random, you know, fish and earthworms in there all summer long, like, you know, definitely have it be sanitary. Make an ice brine in the bathtub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You could. You could you put it in. Just keep adding ice. Yeah. yeah. You could put bathtub brine it, you know? <laughs> okay, James, let's talk about... The, now, there's lots of different brines and lots of different things you can do, but what has to be in the brine to yeah. make it a successful brine to do what it needs to do for the bird? So the, the, my golden rule is one cup of salt to one gallon of water. And that's going to be like a, like a solid, like, you know, salted... One to one. One cup. One cup to one gallon. Not ratio. Don't <laughs> no, say one to one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> one, that's going to be yeah. one salty yeah. bird. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. One cup Turkey of... Jerky. Yeah. <laughs> one cup of salt to one gallon of water. Okay. And then the sweetness, I like to add usually half a cup of sugar 
But for the whole thing. Yeah, for the well as a ratio. So one a, a, one cup of salt, half a cup of sugar, <laughs> sugar. to one, one gallon, gallon of water. But you can use molasses or maple or oh, brown sugar, goodness. you know, honey. You can you kind of kind of pick. Just I usually l- want to look into what is my Thanksgiving meal like. Right. So it, you know, it, are, is it uh, orange and cinnamon flavors? Are you leaning more towards like maple and smoke? And you know, so so that kind of determines the what you know sweetening agent I'll add. But I, brown sugar will give you a nice kind of like golden, you know, um, kind of crispy skin. Okay. Anything else? Go in there, you know, peppercorns, I mean, bay yeah. leaves, anything. Of course, bay leaves, peppercorns, you know, garlic. cinnamon sticks, garlic for sure. You know, and that's kind of like, it depends on what you're going for. A lot of hard spices, maybe not so much like garlic and horseradish, but maybe if you're doing garlic, then you want to do like, you know, red chili flakes and, you know, mm. lots of bay leaves. So like, again, you kind of, where is your meal looking? If you, if you have really traditional sides, I would do some hard baking spices. If you're leaning a little towards like, you know, you're going to have like some pasta, then yeah, tons and tons of garlic. I mean, you can never go wrong with garlic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Molly, Hi. anything? What do, you, what do you do? Are you making a turkey this year? I am not. Um, my dad raises turkeys, so that's his domain. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually mess with it. He, um, he always smokes the bird. Oh, okay. So we brine it. They brine it in a cooler, like you said, outside, yep. mm-hmm. and uh, then he smokes it. So, so Smoke is that how turkey. it's been like your whole growing up? Was that kind of the deal? Yeah, he's really into poultry. He um, he travels a lot, and so he, when we were younger, he would like take a bird on the road with him, just in the car. So he'd have like a paper a towel second. on his lap a and like a little baby chick, a living his... bird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the road. <laughs> yes. So now he has ducks, chickens, and he gets turkey every year. So are they all for? For consumption, like they're all for. No, like, I mean, there's there's like some you know OG birds yeah. that are his friends yeah. that <laughs> will just die a natural death, yeah. and then he gets birds specifically for meat. That's pretty great. Yeah. So, so when you were growing up, did you always help with making um, Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, I mean, uh, I tried to get out of it, but I oh, did. Really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I I did always help. Yeah, what about you, potatoes? J- you know, <laughs> James. What about you? You know, we had a potluck um, Thanksgiving forever, and I'd say about ten years ago, I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't, you know, I can't have the unqualified cousins <laughs> in charge of these things. So I, I on yeah, I just and like you know, yeah, my my gen- my generation of cousins are all. I mean. You know, honestly, I'm sorry, guys, but they're terrible cooks. <laughs> so, like, I just, I'm like, we're, this is, like, bad. You know, so when someone's mother would pass down, like, okay, we're going to have, you know, so-and-so do the, you know, green beans. I'm just like, I'll do it. <laughs> yes. I I'll do it, it all. You're going to do it all. Our generation kind of, like, you know, I'm 36. So, like, I feel like the 25 to 45-year-olds don't really know, typically, how to throw down on a big holiday feast, how to time things out, right. how to prepare it all and have it hit the table, you know, well seasoned and at the right temperature. So many it means everything. Pieces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you really, and you really got to plan about a week ahead. So if I was catering, you know, my, I say catering, if I'm, if I'm cooking my family's Thanksgiving, <laughs> I plan it and I treat it like a catering event. Right. I mean, I roll in hot boxes, <laughs> you know, I like, have like a keg of beer, like you know, behind. yeah, I'm like, you know, I'm like, we're drinking champagne. We'll open the red later. Like stop, like, you know, put, put away your, you know, like your whatever, menage a trois, <laughs> red wine that you're like, you know, I'm trying to pour with the oysters. <laughs> Relax. So, um, so you get you do the whole thing with your family, yeah. and you are kind of in charge. And I don't know why it would be any other way. To tell you the truth, <laughs> I'd be like, I'm with that yes. guy. <laughs> tell me what to do. Um, so right now, you should be thinking about uh, where you're going to get your turkey. If it is a frozen turkey. You need to thaw that thing out before you brine it, or yeah. can you br- you thaw it in the brine? No, I mean like if it's a little frosty, like if it's like you know three days in the, in the refrigerator, you can you can definitely brine it. But you know partially frozen. But I mean if it's a big bird, you want to give it like I mean like four or five days. It, to get like, there. Because you, yeah. you want it to be, you know, once it's thawed out, I mean, it's still going to be okay for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. So like, I would just be really sure. I would pull it out like five days early. Okay, very good. Let it, like, let it fully thaw out. Now we're going to cook the turkey. Some people say leave it in the fridge overnight so that it dries out. Yeah, after you mm. brine it. Some after people, the brine. Some people want you to pull it out and let it sit in, uh, with the air flowing around it in the fridge. So that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. You're going to get a little bit more of a dry surface. So, t- you know, it's kind of a crispier skin option. I think it works mm-hmm. better with chicken than it does turkey, but mm-hmm. you, that's an option for sure. It's not yeah. a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. Do you put butter all over it, under the breast? What do you do? You know, yeah. I, what do you, I mean, I, I like to rub it down with butter halfway through cooking because the butter under the breast just kind of like melts quickly, you know? Mm-hmm. I like to kind of rub it down once it starts showing some some caramelization. I like to halfway through, pull it out, rub it down, and then at the end as well. At the end as well. But do you okay. put it under the skin, Molly? 
like I said, my dad just has it as you've, a smoker. Yeah, so. but you've never you've roasted a turkey before. In yeah, your life. I suppose I have. I, but I roast <laughs> way more chicken well, than do I put, do. Do you put butter? I in actually the, don't. Yeah. I I usually use olive oil. Yeah. But oh, there we go. But I'm never mad about butter. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. Okay, and make sure you don't overcook. And if you brine it, it should stay moist. But you got to pull it out at the right time. Yeah, you know, it, it, a giant turkey is a good time to invest in a thermometer. You know, for your home kitchen and like you know, probe it. You hit it one sixteen in the in the in the, the toughest darkest spot of the bird, like usually in the, in the thigh. Then it'll it'll climb up as you you know carry over cooks. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't you don't need to go like I feel like sometimes I read like one seventy five. I'm like what the you know? <laughs> like, just one sixty in, in the thickest part of the bird, and then it'll carry over pretty well. Because right. if your th- the thigh is one huge piece of meat, so. for sure. And like I said, let it you know let your turkey rest too. Let it rest a good 15, 20 minutes before you start carving. Everything that has to do with Thanksgiving and cooking it, there are so many conversations to have. It's just amazing to me. But it's a big meal, my favorite holiday. There's like one goal, cook good food and eat it. <laughs> yes. That's it. And then you just pass out my and life you're good goal. to go. And then you're good to go. All right, let's get to um, stuffing and dressing. Let's talk about the traditional stuffing. Bread and butter and mm. herbs mm-hmm. and Usually chicken broth or something. Sage, about it. Yeah, like, sage. Mm. Do we like all that? I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah Bread told- in any form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think stuffing that way, you know, with kind of like the, the, the baked, basically the baked seasoned, you know, mm-hmm. chopped up old bread. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. You know, but stuffing, I mean, has been really over the years kind of frowned upon actually stuffing a bird right. with stuffing. It can be dangerous. It can, mm-hmm. it hangs out in the, you know, weird in temperature crazy part. crazy temper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants that. So that's kind of like the, you know, but I, at the same time, I feel like if you, if you want to use stuffing, I recommend looking up like deboning and like rolling your bird, which is a little bit, you know, I guess elegant and refined for some home cooks, but. Once you do it, it's not that hard. It's, you know, I, I always call it like the porchetta method because it's actually, you know, just deboning and then rolling it around some kind of filling. Mm-hmm. So, or, you know, a, a ballantine is another you know, French name you see for it. But I definitely recommend if you want to use stuffing, you should learn how to do, you know, I feel like even Rollatini is a name online you see sometimes, which is like, it's super stupid. But like, you can like, you can see it. Like, I feel like there's a, a Chicken num- cigar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I swear, it, 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 the internet's a weird place for, for recipes like we were just talking about. But I think that if you want to look up the porchetta method, that's uh, and Jacques por- Pepin has amazing video of oh, yeah. deboning a chicken. Oh, yeah. he, Have you seen with that his two on cuts? YouTube? Yeah. yeah, you're just Jacques like, Why? Yeah. how are you doing this? I know he cuts it like right <laughs> so at the shoulders smooth. and just like just like just like rips the chicken off yes. the carcass. Like, wow, <laughs> but yeah, he's. I mean, it's Jacques- like pulling a tablecloth yeah. <laughs> out from under the dishes. It is Jacques Pepin is the the best, by the mm-hmm. way. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you want to stuff it, I would get rid of the bones and roll it and stuff it. That's if you want to do stuffing. Otherwise, it should be dressing and it should be on the side. On the side, you know, yeah. kind of take you know. Um, you know, baked as its own, like almost like casserole. All right, let's move on to sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes versus yams. Oh my gosh, <laughs> there is so much online about that. Oh yeah, there's lots of arguments. <laughs> well, okay, so the it's a labeling issue really at the grocery store, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's. I mean, there's also you, yes. So continue. Sorry. So, <laughs> so they have. These two next to each other, and one says yams on it, one says sweet potatoes. Well, guess what? They're both sweet potatoes. One is drier. Mm -hmm. The more slender ones with the darker uh, flesh is not a yam. It's a soft sweet potato. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to cook a casserole, I'd probably use the soft sweet potatoes. But yams are different colors. They're not... Right. They're white, right? Right. Some some of them? Some of them are, yeah. Some of them have darker flesh. I mean, yam, I feel like, is like... They all kind of go back to like South America, like the p- potato, you know, the, mm-hmm. the hundreds of varieties of potatoes in the world. So I feel like that's, you know, it's most people can name like five, six potatoes, but there's like hundreds in the world. Right. So <laughs> I feel like that, that argument and, you know, yam, yucca root, there's a lot of these cool, you know, starchy tubers that grow that can be done and cooked similarly. So I feel like the white yam is a little bit starchier than a, than a sweet potato would be. I, I think buy them more on size depending on what you're going to do. I like the slender ones if you're going to kind of coin and roast because mm-hmm. um, obviously the, the big fat sweet potatoes just kind of fall apart because they're so they're – so, but if you're making mashed sweet potatoes, then those are perfect. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, it's more about like size and application, um, but, you know, they all definitely – if you're looking for like the candied yams or like roasting them with like brown sugar and drizzling, you know, honey or pecan or something – the sweet elements. Yes. I think for pie and Molly, you, I mean, you probably yeah, Molly, made, you'll have to tell us. I think sweet this. potatoes. Like I like the big fat ones that have a lot of moisture. Mm-hmm. But you tell me. I, you know what? What do you? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like I, I think you're right about that. And I'll use any anything from 
like a yam to a sweet potato to any kind of squash, pumpkin. Yeah. You can make it all into pie, make it into a custard. In the same, and, and same method, yeah. Same method, yeah. You just custard it and bake it up and it's delicious. Now, and, and by saying custard, essentially it's like whole eggs and like cream or, and sugar, ma- yeah. or sweetened mm-hmm. condensed milk is an alternative to cream sometimes. Mm-hmm. I like using sweetened condensed milk because it kind of has like almost like that confectionery yeah. vibe. It almost yep. tastes like it's like too good, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like pecan That's pie. a pie you can eat with your hands. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> pecan pie has that with like, you know, there's a lot of pecan Pecan pies that use like dark corn syrup, which is like kind of frowned upon. I but like all... maple syrup. Maple's great pie, yeah. for sure, but like I feel like just sometimes I want something that tastes almost like candy. Right? You know, like, yes. and it just like just <laughs> those like, super sticky. Yeah, I, those just, are delicious. It's just like mm-hmm. not, you know, like not. It doesn't taste. It's like you know it's homemade, but it doesn't. T- it tastes like you know, like almost like a Snickers. It's like <laughs> right. it's like too, it's like <laughs> right. too sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do we think about all those marshmallows and what have you on top? I'm a pecan streusel kind of girl, but yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think it depends if it's like, you know, if you're going to like, you know, broil it in the oven and get a little bit of like a brown on those marshmallows and it's kind of part of like your family's thing, mm-hmm. I, I, there's nothing wrong with it. But I definitely think more of like, I would do like pecan, maple, maybe like scallion, maybe a little pinch of like chili flake, just like, you know, because it, sweet is so one note. Mm-hmm. So if you add a little sea salt, a little crunch and a little bit of heat, I think you'll have a more, enjoy- you know, I even at the restaurant, we'll, we'll, we'll thinly sliced serranos and fold it into honey because the pressure, the density of the honey will squeeze the serranos and it'll kind of extract the juices. Oh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, honey, honey is very dense. I'm sure you know, you can tell when you pour it. So like making a, it's basically a hot honey. Hot honey that is like so such a great garnish for things. So make a hot, you know, shave a couple of jalapenos and serranos and put it in honey and drizzle that over your sweet potato mash. Yeah. And that's so simple and every, I think your family's going to love it. That's, that's like a, that sounds awesome. That's a really cool trick. Great. All right. Mm-hmm. So that's sweet potatoes. Now let's talk about potato potatoes. Mashed potatoes it is definitely um, a popular side. That's right? usually the worst thing I feel like at home, you know, like well, at home okay. kitchens. Okay, like, so you have to say why. It can be. Yeah, I think it it's can like, be really hard. I, I feel like when you just come across something that's like either like not cooked thoroughly or overcooked. Or, or you un- let them cool before you mash them and right. they get gluey. Or under season. Mm-hmm. Under season is a big one. Mm-hmm. I try to season my mashed potatoes when they're in the water simmering. Like, I want, the, I want yes. the water to season the potatoes fully. So you salt the water? Oh, or, yeah, for sure. Oh, I, mean, okay. I, mean, I make it taste like, you know, almost like the ocean. Like you want it to be like seasoned water. And then when you drain them and you add the butter and the buttermilk, I like to add a little Tabasco and you whip them. You, your goal should be to like not add any salt. Uh, and so like okay. th- there's a decent amount of salt in the water. Mm-hmm, so a lot mm-hmm. of, you know, and if you do it too much, then you're, you're kind of, you know, too late. You're, yep, you're screwed. Right, you right. <laughs> so, so like it's a, it's a gamble. It's walking the plank, but you when, could always cook some potatoes without salt and add them into there. If you did over salt yeah. them, if you were like, balance it out. It's true. If you were like panicking, yeah, but uh, <laughs> you're under the wire. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think, you know, like go pretty salty in your water and don't, you know, don't like leave room to add a little at the end, but you want your potatoes fully, fully seasoned. Mm-hmm. And you are a buttermilk person. Yeah, I mean, like ooh, two, that's a good idea. Oh, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't you add get one little tang. I don't add one drop of milk or cream to my potatoes. It's butter and buttermilk, and it has to be Guernsey's. That's like the only buttermilk for me. It's the only buttermilk that matters. It's so tangy. It's so, it's He's so, a one buttermilk man. It's it. I don't even know of any other. I can't even name any other buttermilk. Right. I've never heard of them. I thought they invented it. I didn't know that, I didn't know that people made it. All right. Are you mashed by hand? Well, or I love if, a ricer. do you get out the Yeah, ricer? The ricer? You like that? It's just so beautiful. Kind of yeah, the fluffy. Like I don't know. Style. I just love the fluffiness. You put in ring molds too when you serve it to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I pipe it out of a bag into people's mouths. <laughs> Right on top of their turkey. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, if you if you have a mix, you know, most people don't have a mixer big enough to mm-hmm. make. A, you know, like we use, I use a Hobart at the restaurant. So we use a big tabletop, right. 30 quart. And you, I, I like to whip the hell out of them. So like they're almost like aerated. The right. ricer is a similar thing. The ricer mm-hmm. will kind of like basically just make sure there's no chunks whatsoever. And that's like a, you know, it's like a food mill. The ricer she's talking about. Yeah, it's like what you would make applesauce with mm-hmm. at home, like yeah. one of those metal things. Yeah, yep. and I mean that does that, that does a great job for sure. I I just usually I will mash, but then I once my potatoes are mashed, I'll take a whisk and I'll whisk it in the pot, mm-hmm. like and, and then just kind of fluff them up, and then that's my then you can call them whipped potatoes. Okay, mm-hmm. so what what is the best way to rehabilitate? Let's say your dinner gets away from you, and you, did, <laughs> right, you know you're like, oh, oh what's <laughs> everybody? <laughs> and you the potatoes kind of sat for longer than they yeah. should have. And you know how they get if they sit. Yeah. How do you, do you put a little more buttermilk in there and whip it up to get it a little more life? It's been known to happen. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think the best thing to do is obviously preventative maintenance is better than repair. (laughs) 
I so, understand. <laughs> so you want like leave it in the pot you mashed it in, which is a, probably a metal pot, and then wrap it, put a little plastic wrap on top, and leave it on the stove. Like the flame is off, but your mm-hmm. oven's on, so right. it's warm. So do leave that. Leave it on the stove. Right. So th- like do that first. Now let's say you blew it, and you're, like you just have cold, weird potatoes. <laughs> you know, I think you're it's yeah. A new name for a band. Yeah, ex- <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would say like a low. I would probably do a low, low flame. And I would just like get a rubber spatula and I would kind of just like fold it. Maybe, maybe melt a little bit of butter to give it some life or even sometimes like a splash of like hot milk or something. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you add too much more liquid, you're going to get like, you know, soupy potatoes, which if you, if it's a small batch and you have time, I would say start over, take those potatoes, put them in the fridge and you should make a potato soup the next day. Mm -hmm. Ah. So you saute some onions, garlic and celery, add those potatoes, add a little bit of milk or chicken stock and then puree it with a stick blender or something and top it with some cheese and some, you know, herbs and just eat half potato soup tomorrow. Instead, instead of eating terrible <laughs> potatoes today, <laughs> eat potato soup tomorrow. It's and motto what, to live by. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, we're if you taste. have time, yeah. if you have time. <laughs> and with that, we're going to take a break and uh, we're going to come back with uh, green bean casserole, one of my favorite things. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get to the green bean casserole. So we got some history there. 50 years, it's over 50 years ago. $20 million worth of cream of mushroom soup is sold every year to make that darn casserole. Wow. Oh my gosh. So the and ca- and yeah. $5 the rest of the year, people buy it. It says it's the cumulative <laughs> amount of money made. It's well, like, they even referred to it as like filler soup. That's, like, a, that's, like, a, <laughs> that's a terrible product. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, that, stuff, that stuff's Just like... Just fill your body with this soup. Oh. Well, <laughs> so this was actually of the Campbell Soup Company back in 1955, Dorcas Riley. She worked in the Campbell Soup Kitchen and she used to test all this stuff and she came up with this recipe. So now um, cream of mushroom soup is sold like crazy at this time of year to do exactly that. So we want to talk about maybe a better way to go about that. (laughs) And that is part of your cooking class, right? It is. You know, thank God. Thank you. Public service. It is is public service. (laughs) I mean, I feel like there's nothing more um, just shocking to like put, <laughs> to put in your mouth than like canned green beans topped with canned soup topped with like canned French onion crispy things. Oh my God. And call it a casserole. So I, uh, yeah, I think that's what that's like. And I mean, yeah, some people like it. Some people like canned corned beef. Like I'm not, I'm not here to judge, do whatever you want. But like for me, I love green beans and I love mushrooms and I wanted to enhance it. So I take fresh green beans, we blanch them and then we make a, you know, I use my talkie mushrooms, which are so flavorful. Mm-hmm. Also, they're also known as a uh, hen of the woods. But when they're kind of, you know, domesticated and done, you know, um, you know, by I get, like you got to create, do a culture, you grow them in a vase. So when they're not wild, they're, you know, essentially you, you see my Takis. But I'm, I'm going to do a nice kind of mushroom saute. I actually had dried mushroom powder as well to really get that umami. Because I think that's what cream of mushroom soup has on people sauteing mushrooms at home is it's so much wow. umami. It's like sodium and it's like that salt. It's, it tastes like soup. It's like, it tastes like concentrate. Uh, and I understand, like, but like soy sauce, mushroom powders, you know, using things like, you know, thyme and garlic and really mm, roasting things mm, down, mm. that's going to give you that same umami vibe. And even like, you know, sometimes you can even have a little whack of miso. Miso is like instant umami. So some of those flavors will show up if you do them properly. And then obviously you add a nice, beautiful, heavy cream. And then you just, you know, not too much because I mean, obviously you're not trying to like, you know, go to sleep at <laughs> two in the afternoon. You're not? Yeah. yeah that's- <laughs> at least 6 p.m. <clears throat> but but yeah, so I mean, just a little bit of cream, and then uh, kind of like the smother the uh, green beans in that mushroom mixture, and then top it. I have to do a garlic bread crumb, so I'll take panko and kind of microplane garlic into it, and then kind of like you know thumb it in, and, and then toast it in your oven. Because you know those, fr- those French onion crispies are probably actually the most delicious thing in a traditional <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> green bean casserole. Yes. <laughs> but they're basically like an oniony, garlicky kind of little crispy. Bit. They are tasty. Yeah, for sure. Nuggets, so for I, sure. you know you can actually you you know use those still if you want to make one from <laughs> scratch. But I like to use, use a little garlic bread crumb. 
So we we service at the restaurant during the you know holiday time, and people like you know just like go crazy over it because I think people want to like green bean casserole. Right. It sounds like you should like it, mm-hmm. but then when you see it, you're just like, no. well, What's the green on? beans are, it tend to be can be a little gray green, oh. yes. which is not what yeah. we want, no. which is why you blanch. And so talk about the blanching in a little more detail so people know like how long salt the water, blanch yeah. this, then shock them, and so make sure everybody knows that. Yeah. So when you blanch a vegetable or anything, really, you basically are looking to. Get it to a right texture, but still preserve its freshness and its and its the integrity or the color usually for green vegetables. So super boiling water, heavily salted. You throw the green beans in. You want the water to stay pretty hot, boiling if it, if you can. And then you remove them after I'd say like you know there depends on the size of the green beans. The hericovirus, you know, ten seconds. The bigger wax kind of pole bean looking beans, I'd say maybe like you know twenty thirty seconds. And then you shock them in ice water. Stir them around in the ice water, get them cooled down as fast as possible, and they'll still have a crunch to them. And then you, that's when you want to put them in the, the you know your Pyrex, smother it in the in the mushroom sauce, top it with the breadcrumbs, and then bake it. And then you want because your green beans you want them to be like kind of hot, but you don't want them to like cook and cook and cook and be mm-hmm. soggy. I mean the whole point of a canned green bean made sense. 75 years ago when you couldn't get fresh green beans shipped from California everywhere. Nowadays you have no excuse to eat canned green beans unless you're like you know really living in a remote place or the girl you know you're scared to go to the grocery store or something but th- there is just i mean i feel like canned vegetables are like the last resort of mm-hmm. you know for for the holidays it's a holiday celebrate <laughs> buy some fresh green beans <laughs> all right so there you go green beans and should we make a turkey stock or something after we're done yeah i mean it? this time of year especially with covid i feel like this time of year like making stocks has never been more important like, you know, save your scraps. So you're obviously saving money and then you're starting your, you know, if you're going to make a risotto or a soup, have stocks in your freezer, save all your trimmings and really start making high quality stocks. And then if you, when the weather turns, you should be, you should be adding some ginger and turmeric and garlic and, and making these aromatic broths and be sipping them all day long. All that gelatin and all those wonderful, you know, antioxidants. It's good for you. I do it all the time at the restaurant. I mean, mm-hmm. I sip broth all winter long. So let's say uh, you're done with dinner and you still have a little gas in your tank and you're like, wow, I want to cook something else. <laughs> so you take the carcass, take yep. all of it, you stick it in your biggest stock pot. Correct. And then you're going to fill it with water. And what else are you going to put in there? You have mushroom scraps from the maitake, carrot, onion, celery is the most basic. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually add a little bit of peppercorn or garlic towards the end of the stock. But if you have, you know, any kind of vegetable trimmings, you know, if you're using parsnips, things that like, they always say garbage in, garbage out. Potato peels, onion skins, they're not going to give you a good stock. Mm-hmm. Leave them out. And then if you obviously are adding things like ginger and lemongrass, you're going to get more of you know the, that kind of vibe. So know, know what you're putting in is going to lead to an end result too. But I think mirepoix, the celery, carrot, onion is the most basic for sure. And then any other you know chicken parts, if you, I don't know if you freeze chicken wings or bones, you should be. You know, you should definitely save all your trimmings. And then, you know, if you're using, like, if you have like beef scrap in your fridge, you can roast beef scrap and add that. Or what other, you know, anything that's like, Meat bits you want to kind of caramelize in the oven. Anything that's like bone, you, you don't you you don't have to. You can just use a turkey carcass that's kind of been roasted and just use that. And then cold water, and then uh, start it low simmer. Let and don't go. be I let it go overnight too. I mean, like I'm not you know be careful. Like you know, I'm not trying to tell you, if you set your kitchen on fire. <laughs> right. But a low low flame. I'm sure you do that too, Molly. I do, and I also like to do it inside the oven too. Like if ah, you have yeah, a big good, pot, you could call. just put it in the oven and put it at 200 degrees, and then let you don't go. have to worry about the flame. It's a great call. That's a great yeah. point. Or yeah. if you have like cats or whatever. I don't know or you know, some it. people do it in their crock pots too. You know, like, oh, you know yeah. they, I mean, I don't really use a crock pot, but like you know, that, that works perfectly as well too. We're getting close to being done here, and we didn't talk about gravy. So what? is the best way to attack getting the gravy right and uh, what to put in it. Is it cornstarch or flour? Is it both? Do you make a root? What do you do? Yeah, I think that, you know, having a high quality stock to start with helps. If you don't, you should buy a couple cartons of chicken stock from the store just so you, you know, you're not trying to make a gravy from water. Um, Don't rely on the drippings because you're not going to get enough for gravy. The drippings are like a little, are like a little bump. Um, and I would try to find some cheats. So, like, I like to use orange juice and cracked pepper um, to add to the chicken stock. If your family, you know, it depends on if you have, like, a lot of gluten-free people in your family, then you should probably go cornstarch. If you don't or you don't care, then you can certainly do uh, a roux, which is flour and, and butter. Um, you can also think use like, wonder flour, which you can just add at the end. It just kind of thickens on its own. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's, there's no wrong way to do it. I think cornstarch is probably the easiest way. Mm-hmm, yeah. Just a little cornstarch and water. You make a slurry, and you can kind of add it at the end while you're simmering your gravy. I think that's It does the, make a nice glossy gravy. It too. does, yeah. It's going to give you that shinier, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, 
that more honestly a lot of I feel like a lot of the American Chinese food you see like sweet and sour sauce and orange chicken they use a lot of cornstarch so that kind of, that's the gloss that Molly's talking about is like that shiny and it's mm-hmm. kind of got that like um it's like a, it's like a, it's thick but it's it's very like um malleable it kind of pours well roux is going to give you more of like that it's going to look a little more like like pasty if you right. if you add too much roux it's going to like look like a you know like yeah. a like too, too, way too thick. Like a over, like an over reduced Alfredo sauce or something. So, <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. Like you know, wallpaper paste. So it depends on what you what you like with your gravy. I think cornstarch is a good uh, is a good start. Start there, All but right. don't be afraid of wonder flour. Like I said, that wonder flour is a great cheat because you just add it at the end and it just kind of dissolves in. And I wanted to talk about cranberries really quickly because I. I feel like that globular uh, thing that comes out of the can is not does not do justice to the cranberry, which is one of three native fruits to North America, by the way. What is the best way, Molly, if you're going to make a cranberry sauce or a relish, mm-hmm. I guess we could call it, what would you say would be the best way to go about it? Well, honestly, I think cranberries are one of the easiest things to cook. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you could do something as simple as just putting them in a pot with water, turn it on low and let them gel and season them how you want. Put a little sugar in there, mm-hmm. you know. I guess, like, you could do you could do a relish. Also, I love to put orange zest in them. But, yeah, cranberries should be celebrated. They're so, they add so much to the meal, which it needs, like, a little bit of tang. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, like, when you're having turkey and gravy and potatoes, it's kind of bland, and you need something to kind of, like, offset that, unless you put a lot of pickles in your Thanksgiving, too. There you go. So it kind we'll of yeah. it feels up. like it fills that place. I totally agree. I, yeah, I, I, I think... For a relish too, I like a raw cranberry relish. If you like pulse mm-hmm. them yep. in the Robocoop and then sugar yeah. them, like that's that's a great way to get their fresh their fresh acidity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't be afraid, don't be afraid of the cranberry. It's like they're, they're affordable and they're easy to cook and so easy. Yeah, yep, they're and easy delicious. to do. So good for you. Americans consume. Here's a little info: 400 million pounds of cranberries a year. Wow, 20 percent of that is during Thanksgiving, and there are which I didn't know. James, you probably know this because you travel up north in Michigan a lot. Michigan has a pro- approximately 300 acres of commercially produced cranberries. That's so yeah, cool. we do. Yeah, and honestly, I feel like Kroger and Meyer buy a ton of them because a lot mm. of our distributors can't get them because they like they're like they're like the crop is purchased before it's even harvested. It's like whatever you produce, we will buy. Wow. So when you go to Meyer and Kroger, they have more local cranberries than like you can even find at like the farmers market. Sometimes. Wow! Yeah, if you're in Detroit on Saturdays, there's Berta's berries, and he always has cranberries as mm-hmm. well. Oh, that sounds awesome! That's awesome. Yeah. So here's a little info for you: Swanson TV dinners, right? First TV dinner was turkey. It was the first one they invented. And here's why. So uh, one of the salesmen for Swanson, his name was Jerry Thomas. He conceived of the company's frozen dinners in 1953 when he saw that the company had 260 tons of frozen turkey left over after, after Thanksgiving. And it was sitting in these uh, refrigerated railroad cars. And the only way that the refrigeration would work is if the railroad was, if, as if the train was moving. Oh my God. So it went back and forth and back and forth <laughs> until they could figure out oh what to gosh. do with all of this turkey. So they decided, okay, we're going to do this, you know, frozen turkey dinner. And then they're like, oh, we're going to put cornbread stuffing and sweet potatoes and then have the frozen bird. And then they had this bacteriologist. I didn't know about these people. <laughs> Betty Cronin was her name, and she was the one who figured out how are we going to do this so everything cooks. Oops, everything cooks at the same time, mm. and it's a safe meal for everyone to have. And that's how it started. So that's wow. how the. Yeah, I don't know if I've uh, last time I had a Swanson turkey, turkey dinner. Turkey dinner. <laughs> Can't say I've ever uh, had one. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? You know, I, I wonder too. Like, do you think they were better then? Than they are now because of the how TV dinner, you well, because of how like much junk is in like sta- stabilizers. Right. Yeah, is a ninth. You know, can we? I wonder if there's any surviving somewhere in some I deep freezer. I doubt it. That's they They probably were real food. They yeah. Probably, yeah, you know they what I'm saying? Were, like, yeah. yeah. I wonder. I wonder if TV dinners are better then. You know, it's yeah, funny. It's kind of interesting to think about. So Abraham Lincoln proclaimed Thanksgiving a national holiday in 1863. Only after the woman who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb wrote him letters for 17 years begging him to make Thanksgiving a national <laughs> holiday. Hey, <laughs> passion project. So like, what are they doing? She just wore him, she just wore him down. And, it's not uh, like writing an email. Those were letters. Yeah, that's like commitment. <laughs> yeah. 17 years? Yikes. 17 years she wrote to him. And so when it comes to presidents pardoning the turkeys, that's a little more recent than I guess I thought. So Harry Truman was credited, <laughs> but he really didn't pardon the turkey. He actually ate the turkey oh, at the National like, Turkey. Sounds like something Truman would do. <laughs> <laughs> so the National, Feder- the National Turkey Federation, who knew? They gave him a turkey, and he just had it for dinner. It. <laughs> it's like, well, thank you. <laughs> I know what to do with this. John F. Kennedy was the first to let the turkey go. 
Richard Nixon gave his to a petting zoo. And then George H.W. Bush was the first to formalize pardoning a turkey. And that was in 1989. Well, we hope you got some valuable insights while listening to that conversation. We would like to thank LaMarca Prosecco for their support. From the hills of Veneto, Italy, you can never go wrong with Prosecco, whether it's in a spritz or drinking straight. We'd also like to thank you for listening. Joan Isabella is our executive producer. Associate producers are Lisa Brancato and David Lyons. Production provided by Studios on the Pond and Rowan Nemisto. Original music by the Mallet Brothers. This is a production of Detroit Public Radio Station, WDET. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and join us as we explore the world of food and how to cook it right here on Essential Cooking.